this lesson is on the signs and symptoms of dengue fever. If you want more information on how it's diagnosed and treated, please check out my full lesson on this topic. So dengue fever is an illness due to infection with the dengue virus, which is a virus in the family of viruses known as the Flaviviridae viruses. Now there are four different serotypes of dengue virus, and this is going to be important when we talk about some of the complications that can occur from a dengue virus infection. And we're going to get infected by this particular virus by being bitten by a mosquito, so it's a mosquito-borne illness, and more specifically it's going to be carried by Aedes species of mosquitoes, so Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. These are two species that can carry this virus, and when biting humans, they can transmit this virus to us and infect and cause dengue fever. This is actually the most common arthropod-borne viral illness in the world, and it's been estimated that at least 50 to 100 million infections of dengue fever occur per year worldwide, and some estimates have up to almost 400 million, so this is a very common illness. And dengue fever is an important cause of what we call fever in the returned traveler. So if a traveler goes to a particular part of the world, they come back and they have a fever, this is going to be an important cause of fever in the return traveler. It oftentimes is going to be estimated that it may cause about 5% of cases of fever in the return traveler. And we're going to find this particular virus, this particular infection, in particular parts of the world. Now, the reason is because of where this particular species of mosquito resides. So we can see it in the Caribbean, we can see it in South Asia, so in the Indian subcontinent, and we can also see it in Southeast Asia. We can often see it in Southeast Asia especially. So these are some of the important places in the world. We can often get a lot of these infections. Now when individuals get infected with dengue fever, it's going to have a wide variety of clinical presentations. It can be asymptomatic in some individuals, meaning they have no symptoms at all, and in others there may be life-threatening complications. We can often see asymptomatic cases in children, for instance. When you've been bitten by an 80s mosquito, they transmit the virus. It takes some time before your body's going to show symptoms. The incubation period, that's the time between when you get infected with the virus and when you start showing symptoms, is roughly 3 to 15 days. And there are multiple phases of this infection. The first is what we call the febrile phase. Febrile means fever. Then the second phase is the critical phase. Not every individual will have the critical phase. This is actually going to be where we're going to have life-threatening issues occurring. And then we're going to get a recovery phase. So either individuals are going to have a more mild presentation that will then lead into a recovery phase, or they will start out with a mild presentation, end up in a more severe presentation, and then with proper treatment, they can end up in the recovery phase. So these are some of the ways that individuals can experience symptoms of dengue fever. Now, what are some of those symptoms that can occur? Now, it's important to point out here that before we start to have some of the full-blown symptoms of dengue fever, we can have what we call the prodrome or prodromal phase. These are some of the days that occur right before we start to have symptoms. And one very interesting finding that can occur in this prodromal phase is facial flushing. So individuals who perhaps are about to start having full-blown symptoms of dengue fever can start to have some weird symptoms, like they may start to have a little bit of reddening of the skin in certain parts of the body, or they may have full-fledged facial flushing. This can actually be a sensitive and specific finding for dengue fever infections. So this can be very important and very interesting. And then prodromal symptoms can often occur for two to three days. So again, right before we start to have those full-blown signs and symptoms of dengue fever, we can start to have some more vague signs and symptoms like facial flushing, for instance. Now, once the prodromal phase has concluded, then we can move into the febrile phase. Again, febrile means fever, and that's what we're going to have happen. Now, before we talk about why that happens, we have to talk about what happens when our cells get infected by viruses. This will help us understand why we get some of the signs and symptoms we do from dengue fever. So if we have a cell that gets infected with a dengue virus, that cell is going to release certain compounds known as interferons. Interferons will then have actions on other immune cells that will then release what we call cytokines. Cytokines are the signaling molecules. So some of them include interleukin or IL-1 beta, interleukin-6, and TNF alpha or tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are important cytokines that can be triggered by the release of interferons, and these will have specific findings, including the onset of a fever and some other symptoms we'll discuss here in a moment. So because of those cytokines being released, we're going to have a high fever. So this is going to be a sudden onset. It's going to be an abrupt onset of a high fever. It's going to be greater than 30.5 degrees Celsius or up to 41 degrees Celsius. So it can be in some cases a very high fever. 
And the fever is going to last for approximately 48 to 96 hours, so anywhere from two to four days. And what we can see in some individuals, especially children, we can see a case where sometimes the fever may resolve and then we get a reemergence of the fever. This is what we call a saddleback fever. This can occur again in children. So along with the high fever, we can also have retroorbital pain. So this can be an important and somewhat specific finding with regards to dengue fever. Other conditions may have retroorbital pain, but we can see it in dengue fever as well. So retroorbital pain is going to be pain behind the eyes. Again, it's more of a specific finding of dengue fever. Again, some other conditions like leptospirosis can also have retroorbital pain, but dengue fever is one of the conditions that can cause it. So that's one particular finding we can have along with the high fever. Some others include a headache. So the headache is going to occur bilaterally. So it's going to occur on both sides of the head. It's often going to be very severe. So it's going to be described as a throbbing, pounding headache, and it may be due to immune, inflammatory, and or vasodilatory effects. So all of a sudden, when you enter into the febrile phase again, you're going to have a sudden onset of a high fever, can have retroorbital pain, and a severe headache. And along with that, we can also have severe myalgias and arthralgias. Myalgias are muscle aches and pains. Arthralgias are joint pain. And again, it's going to be severe. It's a severe intensity. And the way that it can be described is break bone intensity. So it's extremely painful. So again, high fever, a very bad headache, and very, very bad muscle aches and pains. We can often see it in the back. So it's going to be severe back pain, and we can also see it in the extremities. The arms and the legs can become very, very painful. This is going to be due to viral-induced interferon release, as we mentioned before, and also subsequent cytokine activity. And with regards to the myalgias and arthralgias, it's going to be interleukin-6 that's going to be the important causative factor. We can also see a rash as well. It's going to be maculopapular rash. It's often going to start on day three. So we talked about the fact that once you start having the febrile phase, the fever can last for two to four days. But generally on the third day, this can have an eruption of a rash. This rash is going to last for two to three days. It doesn't happen in everyone. About 50% of cases will have a rash. And it's more likely to occur in your first infection. So if you've had dengue fever in the past, and then you have it again, you may not have the rash the second time or the third time. It's going to occur most commonly in the first infection. And where we're going to see this rash is going to be on the face, the thorax or the chest and the abdomen, and also on the flexor surfaces. Lymphadenopathy can also occur as well. Lymphadenopathy is swollen, tender lymph nodes. It's often going to be generalized. We can often see it in the neck and the head. We can also see hepatomegaly. Hepatomegaly means an enlarged liver. It's going to be mild to moderate, but it can be enlarged enough where there can be right upper quadrant pain or tenderness. So right upper quadrant is where the liver is located right here. So if we split the abdomen into four quadrants using the belly button as the midpoint, this is the right side of the patient. So this is the right upper quadrant here. Now we can also get gastrointestinal issues as well with dengue virus infections. So some may have gastrointestinal symptoms, including nausea and vomiting, and some cases, although very rare, diarrhea may occur. And then respiratory symptoms can occur in some patients as well, including a cough, sore throat, and rhinorrhea or a runny nose. And we can also get nasal congestion with this as well. So all these symptoms we just talked about are going to occur in the febrile phase. And the febrile phase will last about four days. And then after, if patients do end up having a more severe clinical presentation, they can enter into the critical phase. This will occur after defervescence, which means after the fever has resolved. And this particular phase will occur in certain patient populations more specifically. It's more likely to occur in those who've had a previous infection of dengue before. So if this is your second time getting dengue fever or your third, and especially if it's a different serotype, we talked about the fact that there are four different dengue virus serotypes, so if you've had one before in the past and then you have a second one that's different, you're more likely to have this particular clinical presentation, this more severe presentation, especially if the primary infection, the first time you're infected, was within 18 months of the second infection. And also if the patient has other comorbidities, they're also at risk for this worsened or severe presentation as well. So there are two conditions that can occur in the critical phase. One is known as dengue hemorrhagic fever. So this is going to occur due to a drop in platelet count, a severe drop in platelet count. So it's going to be thrombocytopenia. So there can be 
bleeding and hemorrhage from this. This is where we get the name hemorrhagic fever. So we can get bleeding like hematemesis. There may be blood in the stool. There may be nosebleeds. There may be menorrhagia or excessive menstrual periods. So these can all occur in patients with dengue hemorrhagic fever. And it's going to be more likely to occur in younger individuals, especially under the age of 15, although it can happen in adults as well. And then the other second severe clinical presentation that can occur is what we call dengue shock syndrome. So this is where there is vascular leakage. The vessels become leaky. This can lead to shock or hypovolemic shock due to a loss of fluids into the interstitial space. And then this can end up leading to organ impairment because we're not getting enough blood pressure, not getting enough blood flow to places like the kidney. So we can get acute kidney injury. We can also get liver failure. And this can also affect central nervous system functioning as well. And again, dengue shock syndrome is going to be more likely to occur if it was the second time you've been infected, especially with a different serotype. So if it's the first time you've been infected with dengue fever, you're less likely to get this particular clinical presentation. If it is a second or third time you've been infected with dengue fever and it's a different serotype, that's especially important, then you're more at risk for dengue shock syndrome. And the critical phase, these two conditions can last for a couple of days. Then we can move into the recovery phase. And in the recovery phase, there's going to be symptom improvement. But even though symptoms may resolve and there may be some stabilization of vital signs, especially if you were in the critical phase, even with improvement in symptoms, there can be new symptoms that can occur. One of them is a new onset of a pruritic rash. So it's going to be pruritic this time. Pruritic means itchy. So it's going to be an itchy rash that can erupt in the recovery phase. So in the next couple of days after the, the critical phase, or if you weren't in the critical phase, if you were in the febrile phase, you may also go to the recovery phase or maybe an improvement in your prior rash, but then you may have an eruption of a new rash. This time again, it's going to be itchy. The first rash wasn't itchy, but this time it will be. And then we can also see fatigue occurring as well. And fatigue can last for a couple of days, but it could also last for weeks to months. So this can also be an important long-lasting effect of dengue fever infections. If you want to learn more about dengue fever, please check my full lesson on that topic. Please consider joining as a member for members only content. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.